library for letting us use the firefly room tonight. Uh, for those of you whom I haven't met, I'm your Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner. I'd also like to thank local law enforcement officials for their service this evening. This is my fourth meeting in 2018. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns, and in fact, in 2017, I held 115 public meetings. You may have heard that some of these meetings have become contentious, so I want to be sure to review the rules we need to adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange ideas. First, I ask you all to sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears on the sign-in slips. That way, I'll know to call on you during the first portion of the meeting. I will be giving priority to those of you who reside in Tulsa, and then if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th Congressional District. If additional time is available, I will call on those who don't reside in the 5th District. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized as the floor the opportunity to speak without interruptions, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment that you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. Uh, that way we can hear from as many of you as we can within the time restraints. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. We can all agree without being disagreeable. Signs are okay in this room as long as they are neither disruptive nor obstructive. <coughs> the second portion of this meeting will be to those of you who seek my help with personal problems that they are experiencing with the federal government. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation and is not the time for continuous discussion in the general part of the meeting. Any filming or recording is prohibited sure, during this portion sure. of the meeting. Uh, many of the one-on-one -on -one comments that I get are from veterans uh, who are having problems with VA medical, and there's no reason why that kind of material should end up being upon social media, and we should respect the privacy of the people who are giving that information. I would like to note that the Tosa Library has asked that we vacate this room by 8.45 this evening. So I will adjourn the Q&A portion of the meeting at approximately 8.15 p.m., to allow some time at the end of the evening for those of you who are having personal problems with the federal government to speak with me privately. So with any further ado, first up in this part of the meeting is Jim Hostetter of Portland Avenue in Postal. Thank you. Uh, recently, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunes, drafted a memo impugning <coughs> the reputation of the FBI and the Justice Department. Many Republican members of Congress have likewise referred that the FBI and Justice Department have a vendetta against the President. Fox News is taking a similar <coughs> position. All this seems intended to question the fairness and legitimacy of the Mueller investigation. My question, do you support the work of Special Counselor Mueller, and what steps have you taken and your colleagues to prevent him from dismissing you? Well, first of all, I do support Mr. Mueller's investigation. In the last decade, during the six years I was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee and he was the FBI director, I had nothing but a professional relationship with him. Uh, I think we had mutual respect for each other, and he had a lot of problems with procurement, you know, of virtual case tech uh, tracking equipment you know, where there were some of the providers that did not provide what was needed in the contract. You know, we talked about this, asked for my forbearance, you know, and said that he was planning on referring uh, some of these matters to the civil division to get the civil lawsuit to recoup the money that had been paid. So the answer to that question is yes, I support Bob Mueller. Now, I have read the Nunes uh, memo after it was released. There was nothing in the Nunes memo that related to the Mueller investigation. Uh, you know, as far as Mr. Mueller's uh, continued uh, 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 position, uh, uh, work in that position, under the Constitution, that is entirely an executive branch uh, uh, responsibility under the Appointments Clause of the U.S. Constitution. 
So even if Congress should pass legislation prohibiting his firing, I believe that would be struck down very quickly by a federal court uh, because uh, the president does have plenary power you know, to make these types of appointments, and if he wants to hire somebody, he can fire somebody. I hope the president does not do that with Mr. Mueller. So nothing has really been done to protect him in any particular way because you don't think there is? I don't think there's anything that constitutionally can be done. And all of us took an oath of office at the beginning of each term to uphold the Constitution, and I cannot, consistent with that oath in good conscience, vote for legislation that I believe is not constitutional. And, you know, there, there have been all recent Supreme Court cases uh, that, you know, attempted to uh, take away the appointments clause uh, and uh, uh, prevent the firing of somebody who was appointed uh, by a president, and uh, the federal courts have said that those laws are unconstitutional. So anybody that tries to tell you that Congress has got the constitutional authority to stop Mueller's firing is giving you a bill of goods because it really is not. A. Levy, North 70th Street. Hi. Um, polls show that between 80% and 90% of Americans want to see that the dreamers get rights to citizenship. Um, what I'm asking you is, do you ever think about if your life were not so fortunate and if there was an earthquake or a disaster or something like the Hondurans and uh, people from El Salvador experience? How about being in a train wreck? Because I'm a survivor of that a couple of weeks ago. That would have been terrible. Yeah. That would have been terrible. And I think we're all taught by our parents to put ourselves in other people's shoes, correct? Yes. You know? to try and see it from somebody else's eyes. So if I'm in the United States and I'm not a citizen, but I'm here because my parents brought me here, you know, and I had no choice in the matter, or I came because there was, you know, such violence in my country that I, you know, escaped that violence. And I've been here for 10, 20 years, sometimes even 30 years. And in that time, I can't put my life on hold. I can't, you know, not fall in love. I cannot not have children because I'm a person that, you know, wants all the things that anybody else would want. So have you ever put yourself in these people's position and can you say then that you couldn't vote for a, a vote to give them a, a path towards citizenship? I mean, what, what's your real position on well, that? You know, let me say, I believe that the Dreamers should be allowed to stay in the country. And I am a co-sponsor of the Good Black Bill that does that. However, the President has said quite explicitly that he will not sign a bill that does that without having border security in it and paying for the border <coughs> security. Uh, in order to keep the Dreamers in the country past March 5th and preventing them from being deportable, not that they're all going to be deported uh, uh, instantly or you know even you know in the long-term future. This president is going to have to be presented a bill that he will sign, and you know that's the way it is. And you know people who come, you know, and say, "Oh, help out the dreamers," but forget about the border security, you know, are basically saying that they're putting their opposition to border security ahead of helping out the dreamers. I don't want to do that. I want to see a bill that passes both houses and is signed by the President of the United States that will help out the Dreamers under the conditions that President Trump has said publicly and repeatedly. And, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, uh, you know, he is the President of the United States. Uh, he has the power to sign or veto legislation. And if you want to help out the Dreamers, you've got to get a bill signed. But President Trump also said before television cameras that whatever Congress brings to him, he will sign. He said that. Well, he whatever said that, Congress brings to him. Well, I don't think Congress is going to bring to him anything that does not have border security in it. And after he said anything that Congress sends him, he will sign, he has stated that he will not sign a bill 
uh, that does not contain the border security that he has called for. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Now, I guess the question is, is does anybody really want to risk a veto, you know, of legislation, which again will put the Dreamers in a deportable position, uh, simply uh, because Congress does put uh, border security in there. I support border security. I think most people do. Yes, and most people do. And that's what the president has said that he wants, and I think that most Americans, you know, want that forever. You know, what I can say is uh, back when I was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, you know, our committee passed out a law called the Secure Fence Act that authorized physical instructions on the border. You know, whether it was a wall or something else, you know, high-tech uh, stuff. And both Senator Schumer and Representative Pelosi voted in favor, you know, of that law. So, you know, they might have changed their mind, which is the prerogative, you know, of anybody based upon, you know, other circumstances, including the president. But I'm just taking the president's most recent public statements uh, that he will not sign a bill that does not contain border security. So, you know, I guess what I can say is that, you know, people ought to realize that's the case and realize that this is going to go to the White House as a package. And if it doesn't go to the White House as a package, it will be vetoed. And there are not the votes to override a veto in either house. I can't believe that if Congress got together and worked towards it, that President Trump wouldn't sign it because right. he said True. most definitely well, would. Hey, you know, listen, we have, we have been working on immig immigration reform probably for the last 15 to 20 years on um, that. And Congress has not been able to get it together because you've got people way on one side or people way on the other side. And then you got a bunch of people in the middle that won't vote for anything, no matter you know, what's in there. So there's not been a majority vote in the House of Representatives. Uh, 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 on that, and you know that's the, that's the case today. Now, Would you I guess support? What I'm, I guess what I'm saying to everybody who want to help out the dreamers, and I do, and that's take a deep breath, you know, and realize that there's going to have to be a compromise, and that is something that I've been saying for over a year at meetings mm -hmm. like this: no compromise, no bill. You might, you probably won't get the votes to pass it, and this president has said most recently. Uh, that if there isn't a compromise with that, the bill gets vetoed. Would you support um, um, Representative Ryan uh, bringing up a bill that has support from both sides and just allowing it to, you know, happen? Well, you know, the, the majority party leadership, whether the Republicans or the Democrats are in the majority, uh, decide, you know, what the schedule is. I would say that the Goodlatte bill, which I am a co-sponsor of, that, you know, does keep the dreamers in uh, the country, uh, that has got the overwhelming support, you know, amongst the, uh, uh, the Republican members of the House of Representatives. But, you know, what I can say is that I don't think the shutting down the government, uh, uh, you know, over the dreamers, you know, helps the dreamers out at all. And no, but... That the, happened last month. Still... Um, uh, Speaker Ryan could allow conflicting or you know opposite votes to come up and well, see which one which you know, one that, wins the most. That's, that's a decision that he will have to make by himself. And, you know, I don't think he's <coughs> going to make any decision until we see what, if anything, the Senate passes. <coughs> and they're starting their debate this week. But in the Senate, you need to have 60 votes. And there are 51 Republican senators, so that means, assuming all the Republican senators vote for something, you're going to have to have at least nine Democratic votes. Now, I don't think all the Republican senators are going to vote for uh, something that comes up regardless of what it is. I can't predict who will be the no votes, but it depends upon what they're being asked to vote on. Uh, uh, is it Dennis Pollack of Portland Street in Tulsa? Yes. <laughs> oh, please stand up so people can see you. Um, I was actually going to ask something about the dreamers go too, so I'll, I'll pass on. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Cindy Barzak, Maple Terrace, Tosa. Hi. Hi. I was going to ask about that also, but I'm also very concerned, and I confess that a lot of people share my concern about the harsh 
tactics that ICE is using to deport people in this country. It, it's not, in, in my view, what America is all about. This is, this is Thank you. young man sitting in Kenosha detention, his name is Miguel Perez. He is served two tours of duty in Afghanistan, and we are going to deport him. Now, really, is that is that our country? Well, let me say, I'm not familiar with that case. Well, so I, I wish you would. Well, let's get familiar with it. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, ICE's priority. Uh, you know, are that the top uh, <coughs> the people that we take priority in reporting are those that have criminal records. Uh, uh, um, and if somebody has a criminal record and is in this country illegally, they ought to be deported because they have abused our hospitality. And uh, to have a criminal <coughs> record, you either got to plead guilty or be found guilty by a jury. Um, uh, um, so, you know, I don't think that, you know, people who abuse our uh, hospitality, who break our laws, will end up uh, being put in jail, not because they're in here illegally, but because they have broke our laws, you know, ought to be deported. Now, one of the problems that we have had is that the previous administration had a catch and release policy even with people with criminal records. You know, so you've seen people who have been deported numerous times and have ended up uh, uh, committing, you know, really horrific uh, crimes, you know, like the, uh, a person who murdered Kate Steinle in San Francisco. Uh, and was acquitted. He was acquitted. Yeah. Stop sowing but fear. He had several, he had several criminal violations uh, that were on his record before his last uh, did it. Uh, illegal entry into the country. And if we started being firm and saying that if you were illegal in this country and have a criminal record, you ought to leave and you ought to leave quickly. Sir, may I just follow up with one sure. point? Um, I think everyone in this room agrees that people who belong to gangs and who are criminals, they do need to be deported. But every day, every single day, we hear about people who are being deported who have committed no offense or have been driving without a license or overstayed their visa with thousands of people in them. This is not fair. This is, we see them dragged out of their homes by ICE. This this is I can't say it harshly enough. This is not America. Well, you know, I can say that you know, unless we deport people who have broken our laws and who don't belong here. Now, I'm not talking about breaking, their, breaking the laws after their last illegal entry and with breaking our laws in prior illegal entries. They, you know, those are not the type of people that we ought to have here. And to mix these people up with honest law abiding, That's what's happening. working dreamer and DACA kids, I think is a very, very big mistake. You know, we ought to deal with each of these people as an individual based on their record. And if they ought to be deported, they should be deported. And if you mix them all up in one pot, there are two bad apples that are going to spoil all the But can you honestly say, sir, that a guy who has spent two tours of duty in Afghanistan should be deported? Well, I can't say what else is on his record. You know, if he was... Okay. Then we're done. No kidding. Wait, why are you even here? Do your job. 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 Try to listen. Yeah, great. Um, so over the summer, both houses of Congress, in an overwhelmingly bipartisan manner, passed sanctions against Thank the Russian you. government yep. uh, for their interference in the 2016 election. And I voted for that. I know you voted for it. Everybody but five members of Congress, idiots, didn't. Mm -hmm. I'm on that with you. About in the last month, CIA Director Pompeo, uh, Secretary of State Tillerson, uh, the Manfra at the Department of Homeland Security, I understand she's in charge of uh, cybersecurity, have all said that A, Wisconsin was a state, the election commission actually confirmed that Wisconsin was one of the states attempted to penetrate by Russian uh, cyber agents. Just put the sign down, I can't see the struggle Sorry, I'm tall, but I'm not that tall. Um, <laughs> anyway, the Wisconsin election commission confirmed that our election in Wisconsin was attempted to be penetrated by Russian state agents. And uh, we've heard very recently from very credible sources in the administration 
that the Russians are beginning to meddle in the 2018 election. However, roughly two, two and a half weeks ago, the administration declined to pursue those sanctions, saying they felt the threat was good enough. Now, um, and, and please understand this is not a dig at your age, but you are an elder statesman, especially, certainly the most senior member of the Wisconsin delegation. Uh, and given the committees that you sit on uh, in the House, I guess I'm asking personally, what are you doing to ensure that these sanctions that passed in an overwhelming well, bipartisan you know, manner are being is is legal oversight. Uh, on that. Again, the Constitution you know, gives the president almost the <coughs> power over foreign policy, and presidents, uh, you know, basically since George Washington has told, have told Congress to buzz off when they try to conduct foreign policy. The law is there. The president, if he chooses to implement it, uh, can do so. If so where are the checks and balances, it, Congressman? Thank you. If he doesn't do so, uh, then he's the one that is going to have to answer that. We cannot force him to do something. So uh, you're saying you, Congress absolutely cannot we, enforce any law? Okay. okay. Well, I do. Uh, Civil Rockwell. Don't leave, seriously. You are recognized. I'm just going to move on. First, let me throw a comment into the dreamer. 98% of the illegal aliens come across the bridge. They walk, they take a plane, they get a car, they hitchhike, or they take a bike. They do not come across that way because they all decided it was too dangerous. But my question is not that. My question is about opiates, which is not a new problem. It's been hanging around in the cities for more than 30 years. My daughter is a chronic pain patient. Her back was broken in a domestic abuse case, and the doctors have fixed it screwed up. In order for her to get out of bed, she has to take a pill because she can't stand up without the pain. She is one of the people who agrees that the doctors absolutely overprescribe it and don't pay attention to what, how much they're giving you and a lot of people get on the cell. But she's a person who absolutely needs it because she cannot get out of bed with it. She doesn't have the medicine because her back is in such bad shape. She can't, she can't work. She can't take care of her children. Now, the fact that they've decided to cut all the opiate medicine for everybody across the board while thinking about individual cases kind of makes me grumpy. We ought to approach things with a positive manner. You know, let well, me say that the knowledge, the, yeah, to my knowledge, is a mass of 100% pain, 90% of the time, it's yeah. hard to be positive. Yeah, well, and I, you know, and I can understand that. You know, my wife, you know, had know. a spinal cord injury. She was in chronic pain. Uh, it still is in chronic pain, you know, as, as a result of that. You know, with you know, with respect to opiates, you know, my understanding is the blanket thing says that instead of giving 90 day prescriptions of opiates, the doctors are limited to 30 day prescriptions of opiates. Now, if somebody needs an opiate, uh, gets a 30 day prescription, and doesn't take yes, it all right. at once. It's always only 30 days. Yeah, it's all always only 30 days and doesn't take all the pills at one time in the first week because they're hooked on them and overdoses and then doesn't have any for the next three weeks. You know, we've got to get at that. But I think that, you know, if your daughter uh, takes the pills as prescribed, she'll get a 30-day pill, uh, she gets a, you know, a refill or a new prescription, you know, from the doctor, she should not be in any uh, problem on that. What I would ask you to do Yes. Uh, is that if she is having problems with this. Not uh, yet. Not no. yet. Not yet. Call up my district office and we'll see what we can do to help her out. I will do that. Yes, I remember we talked one day about your wife's back and my daughter's back. Mm -hmm. But I think that was when we were both younger and neither of us had pain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, can, I, you know, I, I did uh, break my back uh, when my house caught on fire about 40 years ago, um, and I have a fusion uh, in that because that's the way that those injuries were treated at the time. 
you know, I still have two steel rods to stabilize it, so I'm the only congressman that can say I have a backbone of steel and have an X-ray to prove it. Having said that, you know, we shouldn't have blanket laws put the government between a patient and their doctor. Uh, you know, the doctor is professionally trained. You know, he knows what is good for his patient. There are some doctors, unfortunately, who have abused the power that they have. And we've seen a tragedy at the VA hospital in Toma, you know, where people were killed because the, quote, candy man doctor was overprescribing. You know, and we just want to make sure that the patients who do get the opiates, you know, take them as prescribed, you know, and uh, are overseen by their doctors you know, rather than simply writing a prescription and, you know, letting the patient uh, go, by them, go by themselves because that's the way tragedy does happen. So, you know, there are, rules, there are exceptions to the rule, but we ought to have the primary focus of any rule uh, to not get between the doctor and the patient. And that puts more uh, responsibility on the doctor, in my opinion, than on the patient. Because if the patient is abusing the prescription, then the uh, doctor ought to know about it and take whatever corrective action the doctor believes necessary. Uh, Mike Arney of St. Charles and Tosa. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you for this. Um, you got a hard job, and I see you doing it with a lot of print. I'm uh, concerned about climate change, um, and I was happy to see that in the recent tax reform bill and in the spending bill that just came out, that the credits for wind and solar were preserved, also for geothermal. So thank you for being part of that. Um, and I, I just wanted to, wanted to hear what you have to say about what more can be done uh, to promote renewables. I think that there's a tremendous opportunity here. The prices of, of both wind and solar are dropping a lot. Uh, there's the potential for new technology in nuclear as well, uh, which is also a carbon-free technology. Uh, I was wondering what, what the government can do to, to speed this along and promote these things. Well, the answer to that is research, because in Europe, which has had, which has had cap and trade, it has more. And uh, their emissions have gone up, you know, whereas we have used research of market forces and our emissions have gone down. Uh, uh, on that. And uh, if, if you have something like cap and trade, you don't reduce total emissions. You end up spreading them out from high emission areas to low emission areas. But, you know, there isn't a way that a country or a state or a city, you know, can keep the emissions within their boundaries. You know, the atmosphere doesn't work that way. So, you know, I've always been a supporter of tax credits. I have always been uh, a supporter of adequate research, particularly high-risk basic <laughs> research, by the Department of Energy and other agencies. You know, I am not for throwing taxpayer money into applied research because applied research is usually the commercialization of successful basic research. You know, the basic research is frequently too risky for the private sector to prudently invest their money in. So let the government take care of that. You know, they end up underwriting the failures because usually in research there are more failures than successes and it's a process of elimination. Uh, but, you know, when, when uh, uh, agencies uh, like the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy end up finding out something that works, you know, then let the private sector commercialize it and uh, go and sell it. Now, the second point I want to make, uh, you know, is that we have to be very aggressive in protecting the intellectual property rights of American inventors. Uh, the Chinese and the Indians are the two world's offenders of uh, uh, pirating American intellectual property rights. And what they do is they don't put any of their money at research, into research and development. Uh, they go and pirate the batteries with paid for by people in other countries or the governments of other countries. And then they use their manufacturing capability that pays slave labor wages to go out and undersell you know, practically everything that we attempt to do. And this is one of the disputes that we are having on trade with China on solar panels. Because, you know, they've used everybody else's research uh, to make their own solar panels. There has been a government subsidy 
and exporting below cost solar panels. And that has been a violation of trade laws, you know, ever since the end of the Second World War. So, you know, I do think the president has done the right thing because that is one way that we can cut down on other countries benefiting from pirating our inventors' intellectual property rights. Uh, is it Dan uh, Schalfa? Uh, actually, Don Schaefer. Don Schaefer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, and thanks for coming to these meetings. On the issue of global warming, would you say where you stand from, on the one hand, total hoax to very serious issue? In the middle. In the middle. <laughs> so you would say it may be occurring. It, is it, um, do you think it's man-made or it doesn't, it might, might not exist? Well, there is a scientific consensus which I accept that it's man-made. There is no scientific consensus whatsoever on how much of the cause of climate change is man-made. I'm here to tell you that it is not 0% and it's not 100%. But in terms of what our response is, I look at a couple of things. You know, one is, is does an unequal application of whatever international agreement there is disadvantage the United States? And that's why both Kyoto and Paris are flawed, in my opinion. Secondly, you know, are there proper credits that are given to countries that do a vigorous job of reforestation? Uh, because that's the way you can naturally, you know, sop up greenhouse gases. You know, and it's necessary for growth. You know, that's kind of basic biology. And the two countries in the world that aggressively reforest are the United States and Canada. You see very little of that in Europe. You see none of that in Japan. And, you know, the climate in places like Australia uh, is not very conducive over most of the country where you can, uh, uh, where you can uh, plant forests and have rainforests. And, and along with that, you know, we ought to uh, stop the, the massive cutting down of rainforests in places like Brazil. Here, here. Uh, the third thing, you know, is, is that I think anything that is done either by us unilaterally or on a multilateral and international basis is something that has to be fair to the United States and something that will work rather than something that, you know, looks uh, real good on a bumper sticker or on a 30-second ad on TV uh, or things like that. And unfortunately, uh, <coughs> where I think this whole debate went off in the wrong track was back in 1995 when the UN had one of these conferences of the parties in Berlin. And at that time, the uh, the American negotiator was a former United States Senator from Colorado named Tim Work. And he went along with basically giving the third world, you know, a complete get out of jail free card and they could continue uh, increasing their emissions, you know, at will. China and India have been two of the worst offenders in that. And then for reasons that were completely extraneous to the whole issue, they gave the European Union you know, a lower greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, goal than they gave to other countries like the U.S., Japan, and Canada, and Australia. And that wasn't very fair, you know, at all. I mean, it was, it was basically due to the fact that the Rio Treaty uses the baseline as 1990. Uh, this was in 1995. Communism <coughs> collapsed after 1990. You know, and all of those Stalinist era uh, factories in the East Germany and the uh, former communist bloc, you know, ended up being shut down because they were dangerous. They belched emissions, uh, uh, you know, right and left, and they were uneconomical. So, you know, after the communist governments left and there were democratic governments that were, you know, elected in the former Soviet satellite uh, countries, uh, uh, the, the bad plants ended up being closed down. So they had a lower baseline to begin with, you know, because of something that happened on the geopolitical <coughs> stage, you know, meaning uh, the communists, you know, no longer protected their Belgian plants uh, uh, on this. So, 
you know, we, it's a complicated issue, you know, and unfortunately, particularly as a result of the agreement that was made in Berlin, we had countries like China, which arguably could have been a third world country then but isn't now, and India, which falls kind of in the same, uh, uh, the same uh, uh, area, you know, on that, uh, taking advantage of, uh, of what has happened, and they have been singularly resistant to having any type of caps being put on their growth in the near and medium term. And one of my objections to the Paris Accord is that we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, from 26 percent uh, from 2005, whereas China does not even have to slow down their increase in 2030. That's not fair to us, so you've got to have something that's uniform across the globe. So you can't have countries like China and India, you know, basically ignore that, and they emit more greenhouse gases now than we do. So, another question. Do you accept uh, Ospita's prediction that there's going to be a rise in sea level of between 4 and 5 feet? I think I said no. 5 20, 50. You don't, you don't think no. So? <laughs> And, you know, some of the same scientists uh, back in the late 70s were saying we were going into a new ice age. Oh, that's like 40, almost 50 years ago. Yeah, but it was the same scientists. So, in general, you would say it's probably not going to be, you don't believe there's going to be severe consequences of... as Well, a rise of 4 to 5 feet in sea level, no, I don't believe that. I think that's fear tactics. I think that's fair tactics. Duly noticed. People would have thought 50 inches of rain in two days from scare tactics too, so that happened in New York. Dr. Cohen, you will be recognized in due course. Ben Martorell of North 65th Street. Hi, thank you for being here, Dr. Martin. I'm going to get back to what the gentleman before said about elections. Um, um, you know, Russia, a hostile foreign government, is aimed to disagree with our democracy and so discord in our country, will try to interfere again in the 2018 elections. But because of no presidential leadership and counterproductive act action in Congress, however, our election infrastructure is still very vulnerable. Some evidence of this is. Some states and local governments don't still don't use paper ballots. In 2016, as you said, the hackers tried to penetrate at least 21 states. Well, they got into the state of Illinois, border reservation rolls. They were there for a few weeks, downloading data. They were downloading data from the state of Illinois' border system until they were caught. Um, and then last year, there's a, there's a, there's a Russian-affiliated hacking group called, called Fancy Bear. Well, Fancy Bear set up a, a false website that was mimicking the U.S. Senate's website. They were there and purportedly to get uh, logins and passwords to later release documents. Um, to protect our nation, the Commander-in-Chief should lead an interagency effort to shore our voting systems, combat disinformation, and stop foreign actors from clandestinely influencing American decision-making. But he's doing none of this. This is the dereliction of duty, Congressman. He said, our President, and he should really take a stand, so he step up to the plate and do his job. He calls any, any mention of interference a hoax, which leads some people to believe that these threats make, um, are false, make our democracy more susceptible. Now, as the gentleman said, he's not implementing the new sanctions meant to punish Russia for election interference. Not, not, sir, I understand that um, you, you, know, you are in the uh, legislative branch, and I, and I understand that uh, more, you know, usually the president has the authority to run foreign policy. Um, but in this case, considering what the Russians said to our democracy, and considering what they're doing to our democracy now, I mean, they are still doing influence measures right now. They need to be punished. We need to send a message that that, send a message that, that isn't um, acceptable. And so that's why I think the Congress should do its diligence, should, should do its oversight, enact its oversight responsibility, and say, hey, the president needs to, to, to do this. And then what, one more thing I'll do with you on. Similarly, in the Congress, other than the Senate Intelligence Committee, 
the other Republicans on committees aren't going after those that attack our democracy. They're going after the patriotic Americans and federal law enforcement investigating these attacks yep. and trying to stop for future, future intrusion. And to really they can see and this with false narratives that recklessly and needlessly expose classified intelligence information and, I, and, and incidentally, Russian bots, believe it or not, Russian bots puts the quote unquote, release the memo yeah. hashtags because we wanted to compromise our intelligence gathering um, methods. And so, so um, with all respect, Congressman, how can people in the House, especially with Paul Ryan and Gavin and most people, um, defend themselves when they risk our next security by compromising our, next, our national intelligence resources? And how can they not hold the president to be account for his failure to implement the new sanctions? Well, you know, first of all, it's up, as I said, it's up to the president to make that decision. Oh, God. Oh. Well, who's watching the watcher? Who's me? <laughs> uh, uh, I can say that unilateral sanctions by the United States will not be effective unless Europe imposes the same sanctions because the Russians will simply replace the Europe rather than trading with the United States. So why try? May I, may I answer this question please? You're not against it. It's the second time I've said this in answer to this question. I would hope that I would be able to answer the question and we can continue with the meeting. Secondly, um, under Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution, elections are run by the states. Now, I personally favor having some kind of a paper trail of people uh, vote electronically. And I fought for that when I was in the legislature, you know, uh, a while ago uh, on that. And I think that, you know, there have been, you know, enough uh, anomalies, you know, that have occurred, whether it was criminal in nature or probably just some kind of a programming mistake or operational mistake by the election judges that actually check the voters in, uh, uh, you know, that would, would end up doing that. But what I will say, you know, is that, you know, I agree that, you know, we cannot compromise our sources and methods. And if the president were completely free to say what is being done to try to stop the Russians from doing this in the midterm elections, he would be telling the Russians what our technology is, and they would just simply figure out a way to go around it. You know, they're, they're really pretty good at doing that. Now, Russian interference in, in elections is nothing new. Uh, there was interference in the 2016 election. Uh, in a number of ways. They interfered with the Brexit vote in England. They interfered with the elections last year that were held in France and Germany. And a lot of that was done was to disrupt the people who live in these democratic, historically democratic countries from having confidence that their elections have been fairly won, run and fairly represent uh, uh, the views of the people who voted in that election. You know, I can say that Russian interference in American election has gone back to Soviet times. You know, they were uh, interfering with the elections as early as 1960. So, you know, this is something that is new. Now, you know, we've got to watch out for this. You know, I can say that they did try to get into Wisconsin elections. Um, and when the Green Party candidate uh, demanded and paid for uh, a statewide recount, this was something that was being looked at very closely uh, by the then uh, Government Accountability Board that ran elections and by uh, the local county clerks and the county boards of canvassers. And apparently they were not successful at doing that. But they're going to keep on trying and, you know, we just can't tell them, you know, what we're going to do to stop them because, you know, the geeks in Moscow, you know, will be able to, or wherever, you know, we'll be able to come up uh, with whatever. But the bottom line, you know, is not to change the outcome of the election. You know, they got into Illinois. Well, uh, Clinton carried Illinois by a big margin. So if they were trying to help Trump out, that was not the place to do it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the thing, the thing is, is that, you know, they tried here. We know what stopped them. Uh, that is being told to uh, elections officials in other states, 
But the bottom line is, is that they want to destroy the confidence of the voters that the election was fairly run and that there was a fair outcome when the votes have been tallied and added up. Well, a couple, couple things. Um, the sanctions. The reason why the Europeans aren't going to... We already have sanctions for annexing Crimea. And if I'm not mistaken, the European countries participated in those sanctions. So... Um, yeah, the Russians are still there in an eastern country. Absolutely. So, so I don't think that's a reason for Trump to not sign the law, not, not Trump, I think that's a reason for Trump not to follow through on the law that he signed, well, he, you know, or you know, for majority last year. Um, so I don't think that's a reason for, in any case, for us not to implement those, those sanctions. Well, you know, it, it would be up to him to explain why he didn't do that. You know, in Congress, we did our job. Yes, oh, oh my oh, God! Oh, You're not doing your job. Right. Um, well, see that is main. And then the other, the other issue um, is about the classified intelligence. See, what the Republicans did a week and a half ago is what you're saying about um, not giving away secrets. That's what they did by by, by listing the dates of when Carter Page was surveilled at the man in question in that memo. Um, the Russians know exactly when 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 um, what information we might not have on it. And that's why I believe strongly um, that <coughs> Paul Ryan should have stepped in and said, no, we know that, um, we know that um, this memo, it wasn't redacted. In other words, there's a commission that is top secret, and then the memo was not redacted. Now, I, think, I believe that's very irresponsible to, to, to do that. Well, the, the, you know, uh, it was sent to the president. You know, the president could have had the FBI and the intelligence community redact any of the material in the Nunes memorandum. Uh, they chose yeah. not. They chose not to. They chose not to do that. And again, you know, the exact timing, you know, of uh, Carter, Page, the Carter Page surveillance and the relationship with uh, uh, Fusion GPS, that was that was in the public press since about last October. Now, just a minute, you know, Senator Grassley sent a memo up to the FBI uh, uh, referring Christopher Steele to the Department of Justice for a Criminal Prosecution. I have it here with me. Uh, it ended up being heavily redacted. You know, I'm just showing this here, and all the things that are blacked out, you know, are, are, the, reda are the redactions uh, uh, in that. And only after it was redacted, you know, was it released. So, you know, this is a Republican memo that did not emanate from the Intelligence Committee, uh, committee but uh, ended up, you know, what needed to be redacted, you know, according to the FBI and the Intelligence Community, ended up, you know, being, being redacted on this. Now, you know, I don't know what was objectionable, you know, in the shift memo that the president refused to declassify last week. And I haven't read it, you know, and I don't read those kinds of things, you know, simply because if I do do that, you know, I can't comment on it in public. You know, a lot of the stuff that in, is in those memos ended up ending up being released to the press before they are declassified anyhow. But, you know, we shouldn't, uh, uh, we shouldn't, uh, you know, let in the public uh, uh, debate, you know, what our sources and uh, sources and methods of analyzing intelligence or who the sources and methods were. And the Nunes memo that I read after it was declassified had none of that in it. It talked about a timeline, but a lot of that was, you know, already in the public press. Um, and if it's in the public press, there's no need to keep it classified. But, sir, the, the surveillance warrant was not in the, in the public press. That's mm -hmm. the point. Well, so the, the, the surveillance know, warrant was given the first time, and they were issued twice. And that's what they were talking about. But they, they, they were aware that when it began, sir, yeah. but they weren't, they weren't aware of what it was. It was I'm glad that this particular document did redact. But the point is that. Yeah. They were the other one it was but, not. But what was not re redacted is, you know, uh, Senators Grassley and Lindsey Graham, you know, have seen the applications for the surveillance warrant. You know, and, and that's the key thing because that's what is... I'm Excuse me. <laughs> sorry. Turn, turn around, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've read this memo. Uh, uh, you know, the thing is, is that what they did is, uh, you know, they said 
that all of the applications for the surveillance warrants to the FISA court were based on the fact that, you know, they thought that Fusion GPS and Christopher Steele was credible. Now, before the inauguration, then FBI Director Comey uh, went to the president-elect uh, and said that uh, what is in the dossier that is in question was salacious and unverified. You Only know, part which, of it. Which, which means that... No, he's uh, been unverified. Which yes. means that, you know, they didn't think that, uh, you know, what Christopher Steele doing, you know, was uh, on the up and up. After, after that meeting, then Rob Rosenstein, uh, where the, the meeting where Trump was told it was salacious and not verified, Only then part Rob of Rosenstein it. Sent, signed another application to the FISA court, you know, saying the same thing that was said before this information was given to President-elect Trump by then FBI Director Colby. That's where the disconnect occurs, and I think we need an answer to that. Now, I think that the application for the war should be declassified, and everybody ought to see that, in order to see if what is stated in this memo is true. But, uh, you know, the fact is, is that uh, if it was something that uh, the bold sources and methods, uh, the big black line would have been put through it by the FBI, just like it did with a lot of the other things that were in this memo. Well, what you're saying about um, the... Um being salacious, I was thinking out of context, but the Democrats can't be um, dispute that. Furthermore, um, well, then why did Comey tell it to the president elect? Well, because he had to. That's the issue. So, Rod Rosenstein, well, as the deputy attorney general, he would only renew that warrant if there was no information. And that's, that's the way the FISA warrants work. If, if, if they I know, you know, I, you know, I've been trying to revise the FISA okay. Act for years. So. And, and, and getting back to Christopher Steele, the bottom, let's get back to the, the, the big picture. That Christopher Steele, um, you know, he was aware of, of just suspicious contact between Russia and, and, and Donald Trump. And he, he, he saw that, that Russia hacked our election, hacked the emails and released those. And he did the right thing. He passed, he said, hey, I'm aware of this. And he passed it on to the FBI so that we can, we can protect our democracy. Well, if, if, if he did the right sir, thing, sir, then sir, why has the chairman and vice chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee sent this document <coughs> all over to the Justice Department because that they're says, trying accordingly, we are referring Christopher Steele to the he Department of Justice for <laughs> investigation of potential violations of the Obstruction of Justice. Mm. Sir, sir, my, my response to that is the reason why the reason is, I believe, they're trying to obstruct. They're trying to protect Trump. Yep. And no, yeah. really, yeah. Don Jr., who didn't tell the FBI about what's happening. That was what they should have done. Well, I'll leave it at that. Well, I Thanks, man. Yeah. This is the last time I'm going to have to say this, uh, is that we're supposed to be disagreeing without being disagreeable. This is not a cheering section. I have uh, adjourned meetings in the past. Uh, because of the interruptions and the cheering that is going on. I will not hesitate to do so again. And this is going to be the last and final warning. If it happens again, the meeting will be adjourned. Now, to respond to what you were saying, is that if you think that this type of a memo, referring under provisions of law uh, somebody for criminal prosecution is obstruction of justice, then there is no way that the Congress can do any kind of oversight over the Justice Department, you know, without being accused of uh, obstruction of justice. 
Uh, and I want everybody to think about that because one of the checks and balances that the framers put in the Constitution was oversight. And they gave Congress the oversight role over the executive branch. Now, if you want us to do a oversight, then memorandums that were sent uh, to the Justice Department saying that these senators who are on the Judiciary Committee believe that there should be an investigation into anybody for potential violations of the criminal laws of the United States is pure and simple good oversight. And you just think of what the consequences would be if Congress were denuded from doing oversight. We ought to do more of it rather than less. I agree. I, I see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Jerome, I see Jerome Shula of Grand Tosa uh, Drive in Tosa. Mr. Shu. Sure. Yep, I'm standing up. I, oh, you had to get back into your seat. I can't walk through this. Okay, um, I, I have just a quick comment. You're saying that the water rise is all fictitious and fake. Look at Miami, look at Bangladesh. That's all I can tell you. My question is this. The Republican Party went and spent a half, one and a half trillion dollars on this wonderful tax cut that's going to benefit as far as I'm concerned. Basically, not me, not anybody who has, and nobody in this room unless you're over $300 million. And I see this go along, and now I hear, oh, we have this deficit. And every time, every time the Republicans get in to spend money, they spend money, and then they want the Democrats to bail them out and get rid of the deficit. Both Carter, I mean, sorry, both Clinton, and Obama worked on getting down the deficit. And now it's up. And what are they going to come after? They're c coming after Social Security and Medicare because we got to cut those entitlements because they're the things that are destroying the country. And he explained to me how you can go and give this much money away and expect the economy to, to go and pick it up because you're going to make the economy better. You know, look at the stock market jumping up and down. You're going to invest in that? How how can this one and a half trillion dollars ever be recovered? The answer to that question is simple: through economic growth. That's <laughs> 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 what I just said to you about it. There is no economic growth. <laughs> You are pathetic. You are pathetic. Well, come on, you can't get people to agree with you. Do your job. Do your job. Do your job. Get a job. Get a job. Do your job. I want to listen to this, and you fucked it up. Oh, you fucked it up. I think you should be listening to this. I disagree with you. I listen to what you have to say. I don't like your profanity, sir. Excuse me. Pardon me.